the complementary delegated act on taxonomy, which is going to be voted on next week in the in the parliament, in the plenary. Uh, lots lots of things have been said about it, uh, about the fact of um, classifying gas and nuclear uh, under the taxonomy is uh, a good or a bad thing to do. We wanted to uh, give it another chance and have another look at it. Uh, we have um, to do that. We have um, uh, three or four uh, great speakers with us. Um, um, we will and we will start actually quite quickly with the first speaker, which is Christoph Hansen, uh, Luxembourgish MEP from uh, the EPP, the European um, uh, People's Party. Um, he will come with a keynote speech and has actually to run very quickly afterwards to a next meeting. But just very quickly also afterwards, I mean, with more time, we have uh, uh, Svetelina Kuzmanova from E3G. Uh, and we've got Minea Katuti from uh, EPG, the um, energy policy group based in uh, Romania. The event is hosted by uh, E3G, Bellona and Can Europe. My name is Esther Bolendorf. I'm doing the gas policy coordination at Can Europe. And I hand it over to Mr. Hansen, please. Yes, good morning, uh, everybody. And thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, exchange of views on the complementary uh, delegated act on the taxonomy uh, we were of course all very surprised to get this uh, new year's eve um, surprise and present uh, where uh, neither the parliament nor the uh, financial sector for example has been uh, properly uh, on, and neither the ngos have been consulted usually uh, when such uh, a proposal comes uh, we uh, as european parliament at least want to be uh, consulted and get uh, our opinions first uh, on before such a delegated act comes out so from the procedural uh, point of view this has already been quite uh, unusual or uh, let's say even an affront uh, institutionally speaking and then uh, secondly uh, this uh, delegated act in my opinion consists uh, of uh, highly political and highly sensitive uh, change and not a technical change because you usually a delegated act is make uh, uh, is made to uh, to uh, to make a really just pure, purely technical change and this is definitely not the case uh, so uh, from that point of view we are uh, of course uh, just on the procedure not agreeing with the proposal by the European uh, Commission there. And then, uh, of course, uh, and I say this as well because I'm the, the shadow rapporteur on the European Green Bonds, which have to be uh, taxonomy uh, aligned afterwards. Uh, we would, uh, by uh, making gas and nuclear, uh, put uh, a sustainable uh, label on, uh, on it. Uh, we would then as well uh, greenwash uh, the, uh, all our green finance that we will need to get the energy transition uh, done. Uh, this would as well uh, be very uh, uncomprehensible for our non-expert uh, investors because uh, uh, if a grandfather or grandmother wants to invest for uh, its uh, nephew uh, in something sustainable for the next generation, they have to be sure as well that this is not uh, uh, something that we have just green rushed. Uh, and I believe that, for example, nuclear waste is something we shouldn't uh, joke about and uh, label it because th th this is... Uh, uh, a problem that will remain for uh, hundreds of generations and we have to be uh, aware of that so I think it's the, the wrong way to go that way and then of course we can argue uh, gas and nuclear uh, will uh, play a role in the next uh, decade or even decades uh, to get uh, to uh, um, to get our energy transition done that might be true but uh, shall we uh, then uh, misuse uh, the, the sustainable finance for that. I believe it's not the right way. Then, of course, as well, occurred uh, the, um, the war in Ukraine, which is a, a major factor because we are uh, have been highlighted uh, how um, weaponized our energy dependency uh, can uh, become. So that's another, I think, highly political reason why we should say uh, clearly no that uh, to uh, further... Uh, green rushing of investments into gas, which would then even uh, further uh, deepen our dependency. And this the, the energy dependency is one of our biggest weaknesses at uh, this uh, very moment. And then uh, when we go uh, to the detail, even if you would be 
a pro-gas, a pro-nuclear, uh, um, who is benefiting from uh, this uh, delegated act. And if you look in practice, for example, uh, for uh, um, uh, for the nuclear part, it would just be uh, three, maybe four uh, member states that could uh, uh, be there because they would have a, um, a depository uh, for uh, high um, radioactive uh, substances uh, and waste. Uh, they need to have this by uh, the uh, by 2050, and only. Uh, France, uh, Finland, Sweden uh, actually uh, will probably have this. So this is uh, the other point. So there is almost nobody benefiting. And that's why we could ask uh, who negotiated this with the European Commission. The same goes for gas. Uh, most of the, the, uh, of the countries that are saying, well, we need nuclear, we need gas to get uh, away from coal. Well, uh, when you look at Poland, for example, they are not benefiting neither under the nuclear nor on the, the, the gas. So I think this is a, a big lie and it is a little bit misused, let's say, to put the, the pro-nuclear, pro-gas people uh, um, against the, the, and those against gas, against nuclear, one against each other. But I think this is the wrong discussion. And even when we would say, for example, we need alternatives uh, for, for gas, we need LNG, for example. Well, LNG is not eligible under this uh, delegated act either. So. Uh, I think this is not resolving the problem uh, uh, that we want to address. This will help uh, financing some member states uh, their, uh, their projects. Uh, I think this is not the right way with the, to do this with uh, uh, private money if uh, a certain country wants uh, to finance its uh, gas or nuclear uh, infrastructure, well, then maybe they should uh, ask the Commission to get flexibilization of state aid rule, uh, state aid, uh, but I think the taxonomy is the wrong way uh, to go forward. So this is my uh, my uh, point of view. I think uh, the, the problem is mainly as well, uh, nobody uh, from the sectors, from the uh, civil society has been consulted as well, uh, because otherwise the Commission would have uh, this um, uh, the, the the feedback already before. Now we are in a situation where the Commission has married, uh, let's to put it like that, gas and nuclear in a pre-Ukraine uh, uh, war situation. Uh, this is now uh, definitely uh, not up to date anymore. And the Commission, the wisest thing that they could do is to to withdraw the delegated act and rethink uh, what they really want to achieve. Uh, because to get uh, our uh, energy security uh, done, uh, this is not the right way forward. Uh, and we would take away uh, um, finance, in my opinion, from really sustainable uh, renewable energy uh, sources uh, that definitely need uh, way more uh, investment. And this would gen then just be diluting our efforts to get a real uh, in uh, energy independency and a sustainable independency. So those are my main points, but probably you have, have questions as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hansen, for this um, broad uh, overview. And I think you touched upon many points um, uh, that uh, where we certainly share uh, the view um, from uh, the democratic, the first democratic um, um, uh, argument to um, like what does the in the investors community or the financial industry say to this? And I think uh, that is an, a very interesting uh, in in this specific case that we have an a broad. Uh, support also from in institutional investors uh, such as DAB has uh, several times strongly stated that they are not agreeing uh, with this um, classification system because it's just putting up in the air the whole green bond system. It's completely sort of messing it up. Um, uh, and, um, and, and, and also this uh, question about who is benefiting of it. I think we will definitely deep a bit dive into this. Um, my maybe direct question would be, so what is your sort of... Um, um, uh, look out into um, what needs to happen between now and next week and, and specific, specifically sort of uh, how do you see this uh, vote going uh, on, on the 7th of July next week in, in, uh, in Thursday? Uh, where do you think um, uh, are the, te I mean, not the tensions, but how, how, what is your sort of prognosis for this and, and what in your view would still need to happen uh, between now and then? And maybe collecting other questions also in the, in the round, if there are any. Uh, 
Lena, I don't maybe see anything in it. The first uh, reply, and then uh, people can can maybe show uh, their hands if they have further questions. No, I think there there is still a lot uh, to be done because the problem is that many people don't understand what this delegated act stands for. Uh, most uh, people think uh, we are discussing here about pro or contra nuclear. That is what the, most people understand, and this is not the case. This is just uh, uh, financing nuclear in three, ma mainly three member states that would be uh, eligible, and this is not benefiting uh, uh, the entire uh, European Union, the, man the member states that would probably most need a modernization of their uh, energy sectors. So this is something we have to, uh, to make very clear, uh, that this is not uh, being helpful. If people want to solve this, uh, well, then they have uh, to, to look into state aids. I think that is something uh, where there could be some flexibility and then uh, a member state can still decide but misusing uh, the, um, the 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 private investments uh, that are meant to be real sustainable and uh, sorry about gas and nuclear is not really sustainable and for, uh, and it is not uh, uh, respecting the do no significant harm print principle etc so i think we have to be very clear as well saying well we need to uh, to to uh, work on the uh, infrastructures um, that need to be enhanced or that if we uh, um, invest into gas that this needs to be um, hydrogen fit for hi hydrogen for example I think that is the wrong argument because we will not have uh, sufficiently hydrogen in the next 10 years and I think we are aware of that as well um, even though I think it's part of the solution of course um, no, and uh, we need to convince people there and inform them properly and bring them out of this just, uh, let's say, uh, short-term views or the view just in this, uh, this delegated act is about positioning ourselves about pro and contra nuclear, pro and contra gas. No, it's not the case. It is uh, that it is not uh, the right way forward and that we are uh, here greenwashing uh, something that uh, should not be uh, done, definitely. So uh, I will have to do this in my political group uh, because uh, this is something that is not necessarily... Um, we have many different delegations that have different positions and some are just uh, using this politically without looking at the facts, without looking at uh, what is really done here and what is allowed or not allowed under EU taxonomy because if they would uh, see uh, the many delegations, I have the lists uh, still uh, in front of me, where we can see clearly, uh, um, for example, Austria, there would no, uh, not be uh, a gas plant uh, financed, uh, and they don't have nuclear plants. Uh, Belgium, 100% uh, of the gas would be excluded, and the nuclear plants uh, would be excluded as well. So, uh, Bulgaria, 100% of their nuclear plants would be excluded. So, and the projects, uh, because they they just don't have the depositories, and this depository has to be in the member state uh, that is making the investments. So, unless they have something like that, uh, they are not eligible. So, even if they would be in favor. Uh, of that, well, then the delegated act would be uh, would have to be changed, but for another reason, and uh, so they have all interest to, to reject it as well. Thanks a lot. Um, I see some questions maybe coming in here. Um, Daniel Duma, uh, what do you think are the real stakes of the CDA? At face value it seems like the benefit is low compared to the cost of issuing such a controversial act uh, so a question from daniel duma i don't know maybe you want to quickly introduce yourself or we i mean we let uh, mr hansen uh, get back to this uh, question but maybe you can just uh be very quick because the debate has started in my working group okay so i mean it's about what it seems like the benefit is low compared to the cost of issuing such a controversial act what are the real stakes of the cda can I be very frank? Please. I think that uh, Germany and France uh, heavily lobbied the European Commission and that this uh, CDA is designed uh, mainly for those uh, two big member states. There are several others that have uh, very little benefit from it, but it's just to get the finance for the, the huge uh, new investments that the old uh, nuclear power plants in France would need and the investment in gas uh, in uh, Germany would need. So this is, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the main 
the main reason behind uh, because uh, clearly uh, there are uh, just a few member states but mainly uh, Germany and France benefiting from this de uh, delegated act to get their uh, respective uh, energy transitions or uh, renovations, modernizations uh, financed. Thank you for being so frank. I think uh, we can we can share that analysis as well. I don't know if there's uh, one minute still for Svetelina who raises her hand before you have to run. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for being here and representing EPP because as we have seen in the United States on a different topic uh, last week, defining for um, our decade and, and our century issues are becoming bipartisan and on the taxonomy specifically, it has um, become the defining green in the, it is defining green in the European Green Deal now symbolically. And we have seen the division with in the European Commission on the gas and nuclear issue. We have seen the division across member states, often Central and Eastern Europe or Western Europe or some specific member states. The European Parliament is also divided and climate change is not a bipartisan. It's not reserved for um, either conservative or progressive uh, policymakers and, and people. Um, so it is it is great to have uh, people from the um, uh, EPP here represented, and we really rely on you to really convey the message and really debunk um, some of the misconceptions that you mentioned that are associated with the taxonomy specifically. Yes, what I will recommend as well, because I have a, as well a list, and I think uh, maybe you have the same, because you mentioned as well the European Investment Bank that is very skeptical. Uh, there is the, the German Investment Fund Association, etc. Many, many from the uh, um, investment sectors are very much against because this is going to undermine uh, the development of uh, sustainable finance. Uh, uh, this is something we really uh, need uh, to, uh, to make uh, clear. Uh, and um, I think uh, with that, uh, we have very, very strong uh, arguments uh, there. Um, but of course, uh, and maybe what something that you could uh, as well try to help, I think the best would be to have um, a not a roll call vote on it, because uh, many are, let's say, hesitating, but for political reasons, they will and they probably need uh, to vote with their delegation uh, or the, the, the delegation line if we have uh, uh, not a roll call vote, the, I think the chances will be way better to get there. Yes, exactly. And I think that was actually also the sort of um, uh, sector. We will definitely ask for that and call for that across uh, different political parties. But I was going to bring that uh, to you on your way to your working party to um, uh, go and also request a free vote uh, from the EPP on the issue. Uh, and I think the EPP is probably not the one who is necessarily too strongly asking for a roll call vote. I don't know if if it would be the case, then I think that the same the same uh, request would be true uh, on, on that issue. But thank you very much, um, Mr. Hansen. Sure the free vote is the right way because we need uh, to get the majority there so i, I would I, I would strongly urge uh, uh to vote in favor of the objection ah good uh, of course i mean that's even better uh, but i'm not sure the epp is going to uh, to get that through. I mean, yeah. last time you had an, a strong recommendation for that free vote with a strong recommendation. If we can go further this time, I mean, we, we will uh, definitely be behind you with that. Um, so, yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, we have to be very sorry. Yeah? Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. And voila, here we are uh, back. Oh, again, we, we continue with our event. Um, so um, um, I think after this um, <laughs> this uh, quite um, uh, inspiring, uh, let's say, um, introduction um, uh, or keynote from uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, which summarizes uh, uh, many of the points that uh, we also um, um, uh, the criticism, the points of criticism that we also have on the CDA. Um, I would want to hand over now to uh, Svetelina Kuzmanova from uh, E3G, who will uh, give us um, maybe a bit um, more of an introspection into uh, an introduction into um, the, the links uh, of the taxonomy. How did you say the new geopolitical reality uh, after the Ukrainian war? Uh, the Commission's reaction on that uh, with Repower EU published uh, in May um, uh, or a whole process which started in March uh, running up uh, until May. 
how this is impacting uh, on the taxonomy and how it is putting actually uh, f continuing to put it uh, further into a, a different light uh, at odds actually with the objectives that we are looking for here. So Svetlina, please. Thank you, Esther. Um, I want to continue um, along the lines of uh, what Mr. Um, Hansen was um, already um, already uh, mentioning, uh, and uh, more in as you uh, as you were saying um, on the topic of Repower EU and the new geopolitical reality that we have in Europe um, in light of the. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and I really want to emphasize um, what this means for Central and Eastern Europe as well, uh, because I think at this point uh, there are a lot of misconceptions, misunderstanding of what the taxonomy is, uh, but there's also uh, really this, uh, this um, a misalignment and disproportionate um, impacts of the gas and nuclear in the EU taxonomy um, across different member states, uh, and especially Central and Eastern Europe, who are the most vulnerable to uh, Russian influence and most susceptible to um, uh, to foreign influence in terms of energy security uh, and um, and energy energy security and geopolitical risks. Um, so. Yes, we we are faced with a new geopolitical reality in Europe, um, and um, all efforts to diversify and to move away from uh, Russian gas um, will mean absolutely nothing if we are seeking big um, investments, large scale investments in more gas and nuclear and nuclear facilities as well. Um, yes, the most immediate reaction would be diversification, but the taxonomy um, justifies and enables large scale green investments and the, giving them preferential treatment on capital markets um, compared to um, compared to um, truly sustainable energy solutions that are already in the taxonomy. The, uh, the technological neutrality has been completely violated with this uh, criteria as it is proposed in the uh, EU taxonomy for gas specifically. So it is in, in essence giving them preferential treatment uh, for private financing. And even though EU as a bloc is able to bargain uh, collectively and get uh, preferential preferential prices and diversify gas um, at cheaper cheaper prices, some other countries in the world will not be able to do that and are already buying at record high. Um, so my point is that with our effort to actually uh, move away from Russian influence, we keep the demand in global markets high. The mar uh, the market will stay tight and the prices will also stay high in the near to medium term. Um, this is not benefiting the most vulnerable. It is first not helping um, uh, move away from um, from all the all the money that are flowing into Russia from um, fossil fuels and other extractives like uh, uh, nuclear fuel. But in the same time, it's leaving some of the most vulnerable parts of Europe and the mov most vulnerable communities um, with with high energy bills to to pay and not helping. Only uh, making the cost of living crisis a lot of people are faced with even worse. Um, Central and Eastern Europe specifically, uh, some countries are 100% or were until the, the gas supplies from Russia stopped, but 100% dependent on Russian gas. Also, some are 100% dependent on Russian nuclear fuel. Um, a lot of people don't pay, pay attention to this, but we in Central and Eastern Europe, we have old Russian built um, uh, power plants that are dependent on both the fuel and the processing of the exhaust fuel. So, uh, yes, diversification even possible uh, is leaving those countries vulnerable and only substituting one geopolitical and economic dependencies with with another um, while while leaving the, the cost of energy to be produced even higher. Um, and yeah, as was mentioned previously, we're not here to argue what the different countries um, energy transition should look like, what their path to decarbonization should look like. In fact, we are not even able to say if the taxonomy will um, 
really result in, in mass scale investments or whether this will happen regardless of the taxonomy or whether people will invest in, in gas and nuclear uh, just not seek to call them green. Um, but the, sim the symbolism of it, um, the symbolic power that the taxonomy is, is really um, leaving countries, especially Central and Eastern Europe, um, to to be more de dependent and condemning them to uh, a couple a couple more decades of tough conversation and tough decarbonization efforts, similar to some of the coal phase out efforts in countries like Poland, Bulgaria as well. Um, so um, this whole idea of let's switch from coal to gas, which is an actual criteria for gas, for instance, in the EU taxonomy, um, is not helpful to say the least. It's really condemning the region of uh, this switch from coal to gas uh, uh, that at, um, in in a decade will have to be um, will have to uh, switch to renewable energy sources. So in essence, we are lived in uh, we are left in a situation where um, those countries seek uh, such investments, thinking this is the right decarbonization pathway for them. While uh, in the same time, this would be resulting in stranded assets and again very difficult political politically and socially difficult conversation for how to switch those dependencies and how to switch from those um, carbon intensive still uh, for gas um, uh, energy sources into renewables down the line. Um, so to, to, to finalize here, it is not only not helpful, um, it is uh, really uh, damaging and pushing this um, uh, un unhelpful and damaging narrative to the whole region, um, caught in a political game for some countries benefiting from this, um, and condemning the whole region for to new um, uh, to, to several centuries of new geopolitical risk, financial risks, and economic dependencies on other imported energy sources. Thank you very much, uh, Cetelina, for this um, uh, clear outlook into um, how this is actually yeah, pushing uh, entire regions into um, another um, uh, fossil fuel dependency. Um, uh, coal to gas shift is uh, obviously not what we need now, uh, where we know that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions drastically, where we know that we have a, a Paris Agreement that we need to limit temperature increase uh, to 1.5. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Um, channeling uh, via the taxonomy, via other uh, investment streams, uh, money into another fossil fuel, uh, fossil source um, is, is obviously uh, uh, a dramatic thing to do at this uh, stage in time, obviously. Um, I, um, I would like to hand over to uh, Minea Katuti um, from uh, the Energy Policy Group uh, based in uh, Romania. Um, he will give us an, uh, an, an, an outlook into the, uh, the CE perspective, also more specifically. Um, I think we, um, we're talking a lot about um, uh, Central Eastern European countries and uh, uh, how their economies uh, need to adapt uh, to follow the energy transition that uh, Europe is, is, uh, is, uh, has taken the path to. Um, and um, I think we will get uh, with uh, Mr. Katuti some interesting insights on, on how this can happen uh, also in CE countries. Uh, I will take that, we will look into questions after that second presentation uh, from the audience, uh, from, uh, from all of you. Minea, please. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and, uh, and for inviting me to this event. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, bring in uh, Central and European voices into these sort of conversations that tend to be very Brussels-centric. Uh, and I think the last few weeks uh, with the negotiations on DTS, on CBAM, on CO2 emission standards in vehicles have shown just how crucial uh, Romanian, uh, Bulgarian, Polish uh, NEPs can be. Uh, in these votes, uh, not to mention uh, the influence that these countries exert in the, in the Council as well. Uh, we often speak uh, when we talk about taxonomy of France and of Germany, uh, but both of them have been supported by Central and European member states, both for including nuclear and fossil gas uh, in the CDA. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I cannot uh, stress enough how important it is to bring in this sort of a perspective as well. 
Uh, I would like to talk a bit about uh, how the taxonomy has been perceived and instrumentalized. I'm going to speak mostly about Romania. Uh, some of the things that I will say are applicable to the entire region, but bear in mind that most of my experience uh, come from this particular country, so the context can be different. Uh, so, uh, the taxonomy from the very beginning yeah, was meant to be a, a tool to provide uh, information to consumers, to consumers of financial products uh, on the sustainability of those products uh, that they invest in. It was uh, a very simple raison d'etre for it, it was a very basic premise, it was a new ambition uh, to put out a labeling exercise that will become widely used uh, across the world, the asset managers in the EU. Uh, however, we've seen uh, we've seen this turn into a uh, uh, political charade, I dare say, to, to, to some extent, uh, where the scientific integrity of the criteria behind it uh, have all but been compromised, uh, and we've gotten to a point where we negotiate uh, in uh, between member states with the Commission uh, what are the emissions performance standards of an activity that uh, would be uh, considered sustainable. Uh, these things are not political in nature, even though they've been turned so. Yeah, they are technocratic, scientific, uh, and the fact that a taxonomy debate has slid into this uh, has been dangerous. Uh, another problem that I would mention, and uh, bear in mind, everyone has said so far that uh, we're discussing here the CDA of the taxonomy, so not the uh, investments in gas and nuclear, that to an extent, depending on member state, obviously some of them will be made, with that largely unavoidable. Uh, it's more about whether uh, the problems that this uh, CDA raises are greater than the benefit that you collect from it. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, how this issue has been perceived in, uh, in Romania, uh, where uh, the strong gas and nuclear lobbies have basically instrumentalized uh, the, the CDA uh, into a communication exercise for themselves, uh, especially the, the gas industry in Romania has for many years uh, tried to push the idea that fossil gas is a transition fuel. Mind you, not just as a sort of backup for renewable energies, but even as a step into the transition process, Yeah, sort of picturing this uh, two-step transition when we switch from coal to gas and then later uh, to clean energy sources, uh, which is mostly why they've pushed so strongly, at least domestically, uh, for this idea that natural gas needs to be uh, included in taxonomy. Uh, once the CDA was published by, uh, by the Commission, uh, this was uh, immediately taken over in their communication exercises, basically uh, trying to promote the idea that uh, Brussels has labeled uh, fossil gas as sustainable. Uh, I've heard it being called green. Uh, I've even in rare occasions uh, heard it being called uh, as a fuel that will count towards renewable targets. So there's been a lot of sort of misinformation either uh, purposefully or not, that's uh, been perpetrated uh, uh, at a national level at least, uh, about what the taxonomy is, what its implications are, uh, and what it actually uh, means for gas, especially. Uh, the problem here is, uh, here at EPG, we've been trying to uh, uh, put out a report, hopefully before uh, the vote uh, in the plenary, um, trying to sort of dispel some of the myths uh, behind the uh, taxonomy and the sort of erroneous understanding that we've been seeing in Central East European member states, in Romania in particular. Uh, and we're trying to basically break down yeah, what it is, what it's meant to be, and why it shouldn't be turned uh, into, into anything else, into this sort of political survey that I've been uh, mentioning the, uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, the, the report coordinated by my uh, uh, wonderful colleague Daniel Duma, who was the one who put the question earlier to Mr. Christoph Hansen, uh, also looks at the specific investments that Romania has outlined in its MECP. Uh, and for example, uh, what we've shown is that the 1.6 gigawatts of uh, gas-fired CCGT that Romania is planning uh, will not benefit from the taxonomy. Uh, they've 400 megawatts have already been financed through uh, the commercialization of ETS allowances in the solidarity mechanism from phase three of ETS. While 1.2 gigawatts are being financed from the modernization fund, they've just been approved uh, by the investment committee uh, that uh, votes on, on such projects. So uh, 
the stakes are very low for the industry. The industry will get its money from elsewhere. For them, it hasn't been a matter of access to finance, which in itself should be the only purpose of the taxonomy. As I mentioned before, it's been part of their broader communication efforts of uh, pushing the narrative that natural gas is sustainable. And I would argue this may have actually caused more harm than good. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this, which is, uh, again, not linked to the taxonomy, but it's an investment that Romania will pursue through its uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plan, uh, which is the construction of nearly 2,000 kilometers of gas distribution grids. Yeah, so until 2026, uh, EU money will finance new gas distribution grids in a central and Eastern European country. Uh, this will be done under the promise that uh, at the start of the project, 20% uh, of the gas will be uh, hydrogen, gas will be blended, uh, to switch with time to 100% hydrogen. Uh, now, I'm speaking about this because uh, the criteria set in the CDA, setting those sort of uh, emissions performance standards per capacity for its entire uh, uh, lifespan, uh, creates the risk uh, that uh, it will incentivize uh, different companies to think of projects that integrate from the beginning or at the later stage some form of CCS or hydrogen, uh, which would basically lead to, on one hand, waste of energy, uh, because CCS has an energy penalty, hydrogen conversion, uh, just then to be burned into a CCGT uh, would, lo would lead to a uh, wasteful use of energy. Uh, and at the same time, this will be based on uh, what could be empty promises. Uh, this would be uh, perhaps companies that could raise their uh, uh, capex from the very beginning through such instruments. And then in the end, uh, this switch may never happen to the 100% renewable that we've heard about gas grids uh, to uh, hydrogen that would bring down the emissions uh, standards of a, of a gas fired power plant in the future. Uh, be it purposely or because crisis will continue to occur. I think this is what we can learn from what's happening right now in Russia, because we've seen uh, coal power plants uh, not being decommissioned when it had to, even the idea of turning back on some of them. Uh, so what I'm really trying to say is that crisis will happen. As long as you leave this sort of group for open, uh, you leave a chance for it to be exploited in the future. You basically uh, create a system which offers you no guarantee uh, that the criteria you have set uh, will be met uh, by the investments throughout uh, their lifespan. So uh, to sort of sum up my, uh, my conclusion, uh, I'd like to try to make a call. I know we're discussing this uh, in, the constant, in the context of the European Parliament vote uh, that's going to come out in July. But if uh, the delegated acts uh, will be uh, refuted by the Parliament, my call would be to try to depoliticize the process as much as possible, bring it back to the science, bring it back to the technocratic process that it has been meant to be, uh, and uh, try not to make it into something that can be in instrumentalized in by uh, uh, fossil fuel lobbies uh, to promote their fuel as being sustainable, even when it clearly isn't. Thank you very much, uh, Minea, for this um, yeah interesting um, um, thoughts about uh, how actually uh, or specific examples about Romanian investments, um, uh, specific gas investments, and how they are actually being already uh, uh, financed uh, via different funding streams, um, uh, giving by that uh, sort of an. Uh, and 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 a proof that uh, tax additional uh, investments, private investments uh, via via the taxonomy are are not needed. Uh, and also, I think again, also as um, as uh, Mr. Hansen just said before, it's also it's not a question about uh, being pro nuclear or pro gas or being uh, um, uh, saying that if the if 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 those two energy sources are not included in the taxonomy that no investments can happen <laughs> for uh, forever in those um, in gas or in nuclear that's definitely not the case it's really about this leveling exercise here that we're looking at and 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 this greenwashing exercise of uh, painting painting those energy sources and i i i am also again uh, 
looking back at uh, what Mr. Hansen said, uh, greenwashing uh, fossil gas and nuclear as green, uh, uh, while they are not necessarily those uh, um, uh, green, um, not, not really uh, green energy sources as such. So, yeah. Um, Depoliticizing it, I think that's that's definitely the um, that's definitely the the right call. Um, we have heard that um, this is a very very much a, a French move. I think in the originally starting a French move, um, supported maybe by Germany, but and also CE countries. Um, but that uh, I think uh, in the end it is uh, Macron who wants to get some private and public funds for. Uh, future nuclear investments. Um, I think this is something that we have to continue to say and to show that uh, we are in a very, very political process here. Um, I would like to see if there's any questions uh, to Svetelina or Minea from the audience. And I can't see a question right now. Um, I was maybe going to um, have um, just a quick um, deep dive into, and I'm, I need to see if I can share my screen actually, into that um, uh, who is benefiting question here. Um, because uh, we have heard it several times that um, most of the countries here, and, and that is uh, an additional element of this politicized uh, um, process here that we are in, uh, and, and how has it been designed actually for whom? Um, so we have interesting uh, data and, and, and numbers uh, showing that uh, which countries are actually uh, going to be eligible, let's say, for this uh, taxo taxonomy aligned funds um, based on uh, based on yeah, criteria, whether they are in a coal to gas situation, whether they have a coal phase out, whether they have a depository uh, waste depository for nuclear waste. Um, and yes, so just let me have a look into if I can share my screen. Uh, Linnea, maybe you can up, and that should be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, up, up, up. Uh, no. Can you see this? Up. Can people see my screen? Yes, we do see it. And do you see this slide? Only the slide, right? Yeah, you can see it, I think. We see a Word document. Ah, OK. Oh, but we do see the pie chart. We, you, do see, you do see the pie chart? Yeah, so that's, that's it, yeah. So this is actually... Um, yeah, calculations which have been done um, uh, by some of our NGO colleagues, uh, looking at uh, yeah which are the countries that are benefiting most of um, of these taxonomy funds. Um, we can see that um, Poland on the right. You can on the right you've got a column which shows uh, all of those countries which have zero out of that, which means that. Um, Either yeah, they don't have um, uh, they they they're not um, uh, aligning to those criteria that I just mentioned before. Uh, having a waste depository for highly radioactive uh, uh, nuclear waste uh, by 2055, uh, or not being in a situation where they are in an uh, in an adopted uh, coal phase out that the country has agreed on an on a coal phase out date. Um, so Slovakia, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Cyprus, Belgium, and Austria. Would get zero percent um, of uh, of taxonomy uh, fin funds. Um, Romania would get three percent. Uh, Bulgaria three percent. Hungary one percent. Greece two percent. Italy five percent. Czech Republic five percent. Uh, so these are these are all really peanuts uh, compared to where the where we did the big um, numbers go to, and that's um, uh, for almost half of it uh, France and a quarter of it Germany. Um, uh, but I think it's really important to be aware that there are also these uh, additional um, criteria here, which are eligibility criteria, which define whether or not a country, whether there is something in it for a country or not. Uh, and I think this is the sort of message that we also need to continue to sort of uh, get out to um, 
um, uh, policymakers and to parliamentarians um, uh, as we speak and before the vote uh, on the 7th uh, next week. Um, and I think another uh, interesting um, uh, results that we just got from a survey that WWF conducted uh, over the last weeks uh, across Europe in uh, in, in six or seven European countries, including Romania, Poland and Bulgaria, is that there's an overwhelming majority of people who think that um, solar and wind, yes, they could be uh, labeled or classified as energy sources which are environmentally sustainable. So we are here with more than 80 and 90 percent uh, very large in a very large majority, uh, whereas fossil gas and nuclear um, uh, are only seen by 30 and 27 percent, roughly speaking, of people uh, as being 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 able to classify it as environmentally sustainable. So I think this, this gives uh, quite a clear um, indication. Uh, on top of that, um, there's also been a very uh, clear um, call for or sort of understanding of uh, citizens across those countries that the Ukrainian crisis, the war in Ukraine, has only sort of um, uh, amplified this need for the EU to quickly get out of uh, fossil fuels. And 60%, so also an and, and, and a big majority of, of citizens believe that uh, that this uh, that this war really has to trigger trigger the um, uh, phasing out of uh, or getting out of, uh, of fossil uh, fossil gas and fossil fuels. Um, voilà. So these were only some additional elements I um, I wanted to share with you. I'll get out of the um, share screen modus if I manage um, and still. Up. Uh, still looking also into the round for any comments or questions, if there are any. Esther, if I may comment on Bulgaria specifically, it's the 3% benefit from the taxonomy. Um, I just wanted to say that these 3% are only for gas. Um, and it is, again, very hypothetical because the criteria in the taxonomy for gas is very similar to do no significant harm criteria in the RRF. Coal to gas switch, being ready, hydrogen ready, uh, having a coal exit date. Um, and Bulgaria did try to build a gas power plant in the recovery uh, spending, um, but could not and eventually gave up because it was politically and socially an extremely difficult decision in the country. Uh, the, the coal um, industry is uh, employing thousands of people, while if you switch it to gas this is you know socially for for labor issues this is this is a big problem um so i just wanted to say that politically this is a very difficult decision and economically it makes more sense to seek to switch directly for coal, from coal to renewables so even those three percent that are here this is extremely difficult and extremely hypothetical if the country manages to do that uh, for nuclear, just as most other countries, it's absolutely zero because one of the conditions, and I think most people don't really realize this, the condition is to have uh, a deep, uh, high, high, way, uh, high level waste um, um, disposal facility in your own country, not to ship the waste somewhere else. And not a single country in the world has this currently. Finland has been building one, probably the first country that might have one, but they have been building it since um, the 90s. France is only starting the process now. So one of the criteria is to have a plan to have such a facility by 2050. So Finland and France, who are benefiting from, from the gas and nuclear in the taxonomy, might have such a plan how to get there. But countries like Bulgaria, uh, presumably like others in Central and Eastern Europe, this is technologically extremely difficult. Even our exhaust fuel now, um, even though there are some requirements to be processed in country, um, we, we cannot comply with this. So we ship our e exhaust fuel fuels to, um, to Russia to be processed there. Um, and this has been a major problem for Europe. Some countries have even lifted their no-fly zones uh, for to, to supply Russian uranium to keep the uh, nuclear industry going on. And here I just want to uh, comment that uh, 
here we are looking which member states are benefiting from gas and nuclear in the taxonomy, but let's not forget how much Russia will benefit from gas and nuclear in the taxonomy. In fact, there are some studies that show that Gazprom, Luke Oil and Rose Atom have been uh, behind the scenes some of the key lobbyists for this to be included in the taxonomy. And there are already some estimates that uh, now taxonomy aligned uh, revenues that will benefit Russia will be for gas around 4 billion euro per year till 2030, 32 billion euro only from gas. And Rose Atom, which is state owned, Russian state owned uh, company, could benefit from 500 billion euros of taxonomy aligned. So these are green investments that would also directly or indirectly benefit Russia. Um, so uh, just the way this has been designed is completely misaligned with uh, Europe's priorities and geopolitical situation in the moment and countries' needs as well. Yes, thanks a lot, um, Cetelina, for these clarifications. Indeed, it's um, it's good to have these um, additional elements uh, and, and numbers at hand. Thank you very much. Minea, or you? Uh, yeah, no, yes, I, I wanted to, to, to give my comments a bit on uh, on the pie chart as well, which is obviously striking, yeah, which is uh, another purposes. Uh, I don't want to comment on the specific numbers before I look at it a bit more, more, more carefully. I imagine this is only about nuclear and gas, so it will be about uh, uh, funding that would be enabled for taxonomy for, for, for gas and nuclear. But uh, linking it to what uh, Mr. Hansen was saying earlier, uh, that, that's what struck me, yeah, which is uh, the idea that uh, German and French uh, interests are what are determining the process through which the uh, criteria are being set, uh, which I'm going to bring it back uh, with the risk of sounding like a broken record to what I was saying earlier. It is uh, politicizing it in a way uh, that almost makes it unusable. Uh, in, the, in the end, the taxonomy shouldn't even have been about benefiting France or Germany or Poland or Romania or any other country. It should have simply been uh, an instrument for uh, different uh, ask for, for different uh, financial managers and uh, for different customers or financial products to know what to put their money in. Yeah, it, it, the ideal was to actually use this internationally yeah, and not just to benefit uh, one, one member state uh, or the other. Uh, I completely agree with what uh, Svetlina was saying earlier that uh, the figures from Bulgaria, I dare say for Romania as well, uh, it's probably optimistic because, uh, as I was saying earlier, what we're trying to show is that the taxonomy money is not going to be of any use really to the Romanian nuclear and gas uh, uh, gas industries. And here is also a different uh, thing that's at stake. It's on one hand the capacity of a lot of the state-owned companies to sort of try to actually demonstrate uh, that their climate credentials, which I doubt many of them uh, are capable of doing, uh, sorry to say that. Uh, but at the same time, I doubt their uh, desire to do this because they have the available funding already at their disposal, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, and again, this makes uh, pushing for the inclusion of uh, gas and nuclear into the, the, the taxonomy uh, more of a problem than uh, what it actually uh, it does good. Indeed, yes, definitely, um, Minea, yes. I'm See, there's a question in the chat here um, uh, on the waste disposal facility in Finland specifically. Um, I don't have documentation on that. Uh, I don't know if uh, Svetlina, I see you nodding. Maybe you have. Uh, it is based. I mean, the, the the data that we have, we draw it from commission numbers. So we do have an uh, an, uh, an analysis which has been developed um, uh, by NGO colleagues by WWF, uh, which have been basing themselves on. Uh, commission figures um, for nuclear and on um, uh, global energy monitor uh, IEA figures basically for gas. Um, so this is um, this 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 is what I can say on 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 sort of the general analysis. Um, I see Cetelina says here on Kalo facility in Finland. Is it not the Oikolito on Kalo? The information is freely available. Do not work on nuclear energy specifically. We try to work on the yes. Voila. Um, 
Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, uh, we, we are not. Um, I'm. I'm not a nuclear energy expert. We look at financial flow, so this is what we are trying to look at in the in the taxonomy. Uh, but I just wanted to say that yeah, this information is freely available, and it's also a bit striking, specifically on nuclear, that the European Commission and Eurostat classify nuclear energy as own resource in the country and as i already explained actually the imports of nuclear fuel and very often the exhaust fuel processing is done outside of europe so for me this is another source of um another source of economic if not pol even political dependencies um so it's it's strange that we consider it our own resource um in europe some countries like France, this could very much be the case, but in others, this is this is not. Okay, I see there's a question, a raised hand here from Yara. Is that right? Please speak up and present yourself if you want. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yara van Hechte. I am uh, working for a, a Dutch investigative journalism platform, Follow the Money. And I actually have two questions um, uh, related to what has been said. So I wonder why did the CEE government uh, strengthen the lobby by France and Germany if they do not benefit from this? What is what is behind that? What how is that logical? And the second question would be whether the war in Ukraine changed the stance of CEE governments or CEE members of parliament uh, in their stance on this. Thank you very much. I can give it a quick go and maybe um, Svetlina and Minea, you certainly can complement with more specific um, information. So on the first one, how uh, how is it possible that um, these criteria <laughs> um, which uh, mem CE members do not necessarily profit from? I think that's something, I mean, if you look at the process and the development of the process, there was, uh, it started with an, with an initial very strong political push, which has been during the French presidency federated by um, President Macron uh, around him. He was looking for support for uh, for his um, for his objective, which was uh, getting um, uh, this classification, this green classification for nuclear. He was looking for support from other member states um, and those which have uh, uh, most, uh, let's say, interest in 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 uh, in, in gas or in, an, in 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 another source, energy source, which uh, which. I mean, how, how to say, both got be, became coupled because the specific interest from France, from Macron, was uh, nuclear and he was looking for allies um, uh, and allies on nuclear, but maybe also on, on other sources such as gas. So the other source, which is um, uh, definitely something that uh, something that um, uh, a source that is uh, uh, strongly um, uh, used still and where we see this coal to gas shift happening is mainly in those CE countries. So this is like how this sort of alliance between between um, gas and nuclear or nuclear and gas um, came uh, came together uh, between these uh, blocks, let's say the Western block and the and the Eastern block. And I think along the process, then the criteria have developed in such a way um, that we're not completely under control of everybody here. <laughs> and I think the commission then also has been, um, uh, I mean, in the first place, they did come out with this delegated act, which is a scandal as such, but they did pursue doing it. Um, but then, however, in the development of the criteria, there there was a lot of tension also within uh, the commission with different uh, parts of the commission pushing for very different things. So I think that's how that's that's a bit lot of uh, the, the, the whole the entire sort of context and soup that you can imagine, which then comes out with something that is, uh, I mean, already on the table, having it on the table is something, but uh, maybe they're not with the, with the dreamt criteria, but some of them uh, is the other thing. Uh, and it maybe also shows that uh, like the real sort of um, the, the, those who pushed most for it and those who, um, who gave most of input as well um, are, are, are the French, I would say, because uh, if, if you look at it, you see you see that it is designed in such a way that it is uh, mainly tailored to, to France. Um, and then how has the Ukrainian crisis uh, uh, sort of um, uh, helped to uh, or, or, or uh, change the MEPs' uh, minds? We see that there's quite a shift in uh, a shift. I mean, there is a, a, a different sensibility within uh, very certainly uh, Baltic countries, um, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, countries also which have been um, 
which have been touched first by um, uh, gas cuts from from Russia uh, in in the uh, while the sort of crisis was escalating, um, but we I think it's it's a bit it's not entirely clear cut, and I'll let my colleagues come in here to uh, come in with maybe more uh, specific information on this. Maybe I can also comment um, and and um, only add to what Esther was saying to the first question, how this politically happened. Um, for those of us who have been following the development of the taxonomy, taxonomy criteria and the whole process f since its inception, um, it was clear towards the end of 2020 that countries started getting nervous of including France of what this might mean to their public spending uh, because this is designed for the financial market uh, for the private financial market for private investments uh, but um, the taxonomy currently playing only a marginal role, only would you do no significant harm um, in the recovery and resilience facility uh, and all is only marginally mentioned in the rules for green state aid for sustainable state aid. So I think uh, this is where the process started getting really politicized, uh, getting outside of um, the science boundaries uh, when countries started thinking of what this would mean for their national budgets and for how, how uh, their um, energy mix, how green their energy mix is presented to, to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. Um, and the, the severe lobby of um, France as Esther was mentioning, started in the spring of 2021, where only gas was considered. Um, nuclear energy was meant to be developed, the criteria, at a very late stage. Um, but at, at this point, there was a serious political pressure on the European Commission to announce the nuclear criteria and the JRC report stating that there is no problem, would do no significant harm, the nuclear is causing no significant harm. So in in the end, this is a very political compromise. N nuclear and gas are two very different energy sources, and um, they're incomparable within the taxonomy framework. So for me to have them in one place, in one document, um, is very strange, but this is only showing that this is a political compromise. Um, in uh, last year, in autumn, there was even a leaked document drafted in a non-paper drafted by uh, the French, although they never officially claimed ownership of it. I think it's freely available in the media. Euroactive, I think, leaked it. And it's very much attributed to France of how um, even though uh, they have originally always been against gas to be included in the taxonomy, uh, eventually they proposed a really bad and weak criteria for both gas, nuclear. They even had some uh, some weakening of potential criteria for agriculture just to get other countries on board and to really make this into a broad coalition um, to agree to this criteria. Uh, so in the end, it was very politicized, extremely political and had nothing to do with any scientific evidence or any scientific basis. Uh, what I have noticed with the situation in Ukraine is that the fierce defendants of gas have went uh, quiet, quieter, let's say. Um, so it, I, I think uh, it has made a lot of people uncomfortable to really lobby for it that openly. Not saying that behind the scenes it is not changing. I think the biggest um, shift uh, we saw was Germany, who recently um, openly and publicly said that they're against the inclusion of gas in the taxonomy. But this is too little too late because uh, the, the previous German government was very much um, in favor of including gas. Um, the new government, everyone had high hopes that the new coalition government would take a very different direction. They didn't. And at this point, it is very difficult to get a majority in council and among members. 
member states. And most importantly, there was no effort to get other countries on board. So, um, yes, this is a very symbolic gesture by Germany. But as I said, too little, too late, just given the current situation with Ukraine and um, uh, European dependencies on Russian gas. Um, some shifts in countries that are more exposed and more vulnerable, uh, of, of vulnerable um, to Russian influence. We have seen some um, attitude shifts in uh, the Baltic countries, for instance, but uh, whether this eventually will translate into any political shifts, um, we do not know uh, with certainty. But we are confident that things will shift, right? <laughs> Minea, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the questions. I wanted to start by uh, mirroring something that uh, Zvelina was saying uh, about uh, bundling gas and nuclear together in the CDA, which honestly, uh, I don't think we would be here discussing this and trying so hard to, to break this if this was not done. Uh, in this manner was a clear strategic choice at the moment when it was proposed uh, to create this odd coalition between uh, France and Germany with the broad support of Central and Eastern European member states. Um, as into why those countries uh, are so supportive of uh, the French support for nuclear and the German support uh, for gas, uh, I think most of the important points uh, have been made. It's uh, more about not the access to private funds but perhaps the fears of uh, how this would affect state financing and perhaps even more importantly, EU funding. Uh, and I think, uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've tried to speak with people here in Romania and tell them that this is not about the EU funds. My life was made infinitely more difficult once the RF was put out and it had the genocidal harm and uh, suddenly I was the one who was wrong. But, Gladfully so, because it's very good that those uh, those criteria were, were in there. Uh, there was also a lot of confusion about how this would affect the modernization fund, which is part of the EUTS, which is uh, a very significant resource for these uh, member states, which, mind you, uh, do uh, make a lot of their investments through accessing those funds. Uh, so there was a generalized fear that they would uh, suddenly lose uh, 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 lose those financing sources, uh, and this uh, mostly resonated with the industry. And then depending on which country you're in, obviously these industries have uh, uh, more influence over uh, political decisions uh, than in others. For example, in Romania, uh, the nuclear and gas lobbies are uh, both uh, very powerful. Uh, some of the largest companies in the country in general, not just in the energy sector, uh, are the nuclear power producers and natural gas producers. Uh, and uh, uh, owners of uh, electricity production capacities. Uh, and fearing the loss of access uh, to this uh, to this money, uh, they pushed uh, those governments into making sure that uh, uh, this will not happen. As I was saying in my uh, initial remarks, this has often happened through uh, perhaps uh, misleading manners, yeah, or basically uh, not portraying the taxonomy accurately for what it was, making the point that it was had far broader implications than it was meant to, yeah? not just for EU funding, but also about the desirability of uh, gas and then nuclear. Uh, but unfortunately for them, uh, yeah, that economy is not going to turn uh, nuclear investments into uh, something that makes financial sense, and uh, it's not going to eliminate the emissions of uh, fossil-fired uh, uh, gas power plants. Uh, <laughs> As for the what happened since the war in Ukraine started, I think uh, there haven't been necessarily many shifts about the taxonomy per se, but I think that's something that is important is that uh, populations from Central and Eastern Europe have slowly started to understand that fossil gas will be phased out as well. So it's not just a matter of coal and of how much uh, the timelines for phasing it out can be postponed, uh, but it is clear that the use of fossil uh, gas is not sustainable, not just from a climate perspective, which for reasons we can discuss, uh, uh, do not reverberate as well with Eastern European uh, citizens as with Western European citizens, but it has become a matter of uh, energy security as well. Uh, and uh, the idea that uh, fossil gas will stop being used in the future has uh, become more acceptable in the past six months, I would say. 
Yes, and indeed, that's a very important point that you're touching upon here, uh, Minea. It's really this um, narrative building uh, that we have to continue to work on, which is uh, there's uh, been or there we are in the face of uh, coal phase out, and many member states have adopted coal phase out dates, specific dates uh, adopted in their national uh, plans. Um, we need to have a very similar development uh, for gas, obviously, and and. Uh, well, we, we are not there yet, but it's uh, it's clearly something that we have to bring on, on the agenda of policymakers in across the EU, across all the countries um, uh, to to look into fossil gas phase out dates. Um, voilà, that's, um, I think, the, the objective of any uh, gas campaigner <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in the NGO world, at least, um, to, uh, to help shaping that narrative and help bringing that on, on policymakers' agendas. Um, do we have other questions? Do we have other things that we want to raise at this stage? I'm looking at the audience. I think there's still Yara's legacy hand. Uh, while we are waiting for questions, Esther, do you want me um, to share some of the projections under Repower EU for what are the actual solutions that have been considered for phasing phasing out Russian gas? I think that might be interesting also to share, and it has been uh, drafted by uh, by also colleagues from Bologna who are organizing the event, also some of our colleagues in E3G, so I thought it might be interesting to, to just share that. Um, we, by the way, still see your screen. Really? <laughs> I, I thought see. I stopped sharing. Yeah. Um. Uh, yes, no, uh, but I'll, I'll try to share mine just to show. I think the graph is, is um, really telling. Can you see it? Yes. Um, so these are these are some projections for an immediate reaction by 2025, as you can see, and it's a mix bag of different um, different uh, policy options and different economic options. Uh, diversification from non-Russian gas is still on the table, um, but the majority should be coming from um, the full implementation of what is already planned in Fit for 55, energy efficiency, um, uh, electrification and more renewable um, energy. And this is just to show that um, some of our estimates of um, experts in the field, not my specifically, but our colleagues working on this um, is that we do not currently need more investments. We don't need more infrastructure, gas infrastructure in Europe. Um, but um, having said that, this, what we see here, is already ambitious and a step further. It is not impossible, but sending the wrong signals as um, green fossil gas um, is really damaging for really pursuing the narrative that we actually need, that we need to go um, faster um, and, and um, uh, to a large extent into the direction where, where we need to be. Um, so I thought this is just um, a very telling picture of uh, how, if only symbolically, uh, including gas in the taxonomy um, is really harmful at this point in time and given the current situation uh, with Russia and the invasion in Ukraine. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, indeed, this is an, an additional element, uh, I would say, which um, which is the, which shows how at odds we are with uh, with this proposal of uh, of the the current uh, of the trajectory that the European Union uh, normally has taken with uh, the European Green Deal, with the Fit for 55 package, and so on. Um, thank you for this. Linnea, Lina, sorry, do you, oh, Minea, you want to come in? Um, I just want to comment a bit on, uh, on that study, yeah, uh, and uh, here in EPG we've done something similar just for the case of Romania, where we both try to look at how to eliminate Russian gas uh, imports uh, by the turn of the decade, but also trying to understand what the role of gas is in the 2050 perspective, obviously to highlight uh, 
the fact that a phase out will occur uh, very much so as we're speaking about, about coal right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, it has been a very, uh, a very interesting uh, exercise, I dare say, because uh, there we said very clearly that uh, you cannot rely uh, on the extraction of natural gas from the uh, Black Sea coast, which Romania is planning to do, which it has started to do in shallow waters this year. It's planning to do so in deep waters by 2026 as well. Um, and mostly because of the geopolitical context of the war in Ukraine and what's happening right now on our very uh, neighborhood uh, with Ukraine yeah, that uh, touches Romania uh, right on the Black Sea coast. Uh, we've said these things uh, in the past as well about nuclear, that these are projects that have historically had massive uh, cost and deadline overruns. Uh, and simply the idea that you cannot rely on these resources uh, to put together uh, an energy security strategy has been taken, has been heavily, heavily criticized domestically. But this is what's important, really. It's that what we're seeing right now is that you cannot build energy security strategies on these two fuels for the reasons uh, I've, I've mentioned so far. Uh, and what should happen instead is obviously try to reduce uh, energy use as much as you can, where you can. Uh, and I still haven't seen uh, uh, energy efficiency emerging as perhaps uh, the go-to option uh, for the crisis we're currently facing. Uh, but also in Central and Eastern Europe, there's a, a very good potential for renewable energy. And I'm not speaking here that uh, there's as much wind as there is in the Baltics, or there is as much sun as there is in Italy and Spain. But there is just enough of both, which complement, they complement each other in ways uh, that could not have enable a system resilience that you may not have in other regions of Europe. So uh, it is incredibly important that funds are being funneled towards these sources. So while uh, we at least believe that uh, from private sources, a taxonomy is not going to do necessarily much for gas. Uh, it has definitely done, uh, the EU funds have definitely done so. Yeah? So the fact that the modernization fund is uh, uh, allocated in part to gas projects does create a crowding out effect. It does mean that there's less money for renewable. It is the same situation in Romania for nuclear. The Romanian government is getting a $7 billion loan from the State Department to finance small modular reactors. It's the same. These will be funds that will be repaid uh, from national taxes and uh, citizen contributions, uh, which is money that could have been used differently. Uh, and I think we're trying, we're starting to understand that even more so in the current context. Esther, if I may add to that, um, that, uh, you know, under repower EU and under the whole EU strategy of how to deal with the current crisis, actually, um, maybe not many people realize, but uh, the, the heavy lifting will be done by um, the heating and cooling sector, uh, where renewables from originally anticipated 37% are now meant to be 47% uh, of renewable energy sources um, by I think 2030. Um, and a lot of people are truly concerned as winter um, is approaching what the energy uh, prices would actually look like. So it is important to keep that in mind that we actually need massive investments in renewable energy sources in order to be able to um, really cut the dependencies on both high prices and, and, um, and energy sources from, from Russia. Um, and this is what the taxonomy was originally meant to be doing. It was it was meant to channel not to channel money, but to help people who want to truly invest in clean um, decarbonization solutions to know that their money is going there. So this was what the taxonomy was meant to be doing. And large scale investments called green um, under the taxonomy in, in gas and nuclear infrastructure, these are extremely expensive um, investments and they inevitably divert financing from where it is needed in the energy, um, in the energy mix of countries. Um, so I think it is important to remember Remember that countries need to, to have a strategy what their energy mix should look like. And if they truly, af after they have um, 
um, reach the level of uh, certain investments in renewables they need they need and and maybe consider if they need in the interim period um, other other um, solutions like uh, gas uh, for a short period for a limited period of time um, then start thinking of how to attract those investments not um, uh, forcefully putting them into a list into a green list and greenwashing and in that way diverting capital from where it is much more needed um, given the current situation Minea, and I think we should then go into concluding remarks. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to follow up on that because I think uh, you made a very good point about yeah, the, the purpose yeah, of the taxonomy value was meant to do. And uh, here it's very important that one of, one of its raison d'etre was to simplify the process, yeah, to make it easier uh, for investment funds to find those uh, uh, investments that make sense uh, in the long term from a sustainability perspective. Well. The way the CDA and the taxonomy looks right now uh, will make uh, many investors and financial actors to either completely ignore the taxonomy. So then the, uh, a widely used taxonomy uh, would, uh, would not come into, uh, into being, which is a purpose yeah, when it was launched. And at the same time, for others, perhaps it will not simplify the process because it will require double checking. It will require to see if renewable investments have been bundled together with gas investments, for example. Uh, which some uh, financial uh, actors will not want to invest in. So in the end, the way it looks right now uh, has failed on all purposes yeah, for which it was, uh, it was designed. Yes, thanks. I think these are um, uh, important points to clarify that um, we are not, I mean, that we are going away from an initial objective uh, very clearly with this, um, with this complementary delegated act. Um, I am wondering whether Lena still wanted to do a bit of an, uh, an, an, an overview of the previous series uh, of that um, um, series of events that you organized around the taxonomy uh, and coming in with different types of um, arguments and, and sort of uh, backgrounds around the topic. Um, is, it, um, is this a good moment for you to come in uh, before we close the meeting? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Esther. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, quite brief uh, and I think that most of the uh, topics and aspects of it has been mentioned already. Um, so what I wanted to say was, of course, first of all, thank you very much to Kenny and Esther for uh, moderating this event and also very big thank you to uh, Cetelina and E3G for co-organizing and then also, of course, to EPG and Minea for participating. And also, um, I wanted to say that I think uh, this has been an event that has gone into very uh, much detail on a topic that I think um, needs much more attention. Um, so we will make sure that this recording is made public and we will circulate it as well to uh, the parliament. And we also want to encourage anyone here listening to, to do the same. And we will also have an article summarizing the points up on our website um, in, uh, in a short time. But I also wanted to mention that uh, for those of you listening, uh, since there has been a lot of mentions about other topics, for example, now we're talking about how the financial markets potentially are reacting, what was the point of the taxonomy originally, I wanted to do a quick run through of the events that might be of interest to you to also do a deep dive into those aspects. So firstly, of course, I wanted to mention our event that we did on the democratic uh, process uh, or maybe to say different the lack or the breach of the democratic process when it comes to the taxonomy CDA, as well as the breach of the taxonomy regulation. And here I think uh, uh, MEP Sipa Petikainen said it very well when she said that after uh, over 20 years in the parliament, this is the worst case she has seen of a breach of mandate um, on a delegated act. Uh, this, of course, is also all available on our website. Uh, for those of you interested in learning more about the point that was just mentioned on the financial markets, uh, our second event together with Climate Bonds Initiative, oh, and I have to mention the first event, of course, was together with Client Earth. Uh, the second event was together with Climate Bonds Initiative and uh, focuses on how financial market participants have reacted to this. What are the chances, chances of the taxonomy actually having credibility in the market? 
And how much of an opportunity cost are we facing um, if the taxonomy fails to shift um, capital towards sustainable projects because it does not have uh, credibility amongst investors? Uh, and as uh, MEP Philip Lambert said it quite well, we do not need this taxonomy CDA. We have um, rules already approved and technology neutrality principles that does not need breaching. The third event, uh, we focused in particular on the uh, fossil gas criteria and MEP Michael Bloss spoke to the uh, changing of the criteria to fit gas uh, as a political decision rather than uh, one based in science. And we also had the benefit there of Svetlina giving us a bit of a, a taster to the repower and the CEE discussion today. So I just want to tell you all that this is freely available. We also have explainers available online and I don't think I will delve into the uh, uh, points anymore because I think they were very well uh, discussed already in this event. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Lina. And uh, I guess that you will circulate as you did for the previous events, um, the recordings um, of this one um, so that it is um, available to um, those who could not join uh, or those who want to re-listen to it. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you as well for having invited me, for having invited all of these wonderful speakers. Um, and I would, think the, would like to thank them for their presentations um, and um, call on uh, people to uh, mobilize as many MEPs, um, friends, people to reach out to MEPs ahead of the 7th next week uh, and to bring forward um, arguments uh, that you have heard now. Um, we, as Can Europe, for instance, have put together a communications pack uh, which uh, compiles as much as possible different initiatives, uh, different arguments, but also initiatives, mobilizing initiatives, uh, reach out uh, actions from WeMove, from uh, 350.org, from WWF, from uh, organizations across the board um, to reach out uh, to uh, your national MEPs um, in the next uh, eight, nine days, I think nine days are left up to the vote in Strasbourg in the plenary next week on Thursday. Um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all, thank you Esther. Bye.